Okay, everyone. Uh, welcome to the annual call uh, webinar for animal health. Uh, in particular, today we're going to discuss uh, transmission and epidemiology of Tyleria orientalis group. Um, my name is Irene Sabota. I'm the MLA's program manager for consultation. One of my jobs is to look after the uh, MLA's annual call, but uh, also to look after the regional consultation with producers that sits behind and guides the annual call. Re the regional consultation is the process where MLA um, gets uh, asked producers for their priorities uh, for MLA to invest in on farm R&D and A. Um, thanks very much for taking the time to come today. We have uh, invited our, uh, our program manager for this program, which is Johan Schroeder. Johan is online, and Johan is here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, I'll also ask Johan in a minute to briefly run through the key points uh, of the sample reference document. Uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to briefly uh, remind you and show you uh, here on the screen the timeline for the annual call for 2018-19. So right now we're looking at, uh, we're calling for projects that will start in the 2018-19 summit. Um, the call went live uh, last week uh, on Wednesday, the 27th of September, and it will stay open until the 30th of October, which is just one day short of five weeks. So we have a little bit more time this year than we had last year. And in principle, that, that you will see, for those of you that participated in the annual call before, that there's a little bit of change. Every year we try to address feedback from uh, stakeholders and from researchers as like yourself. Uh, and we try to make small changes to really accommodate the feedback we're getting. So this year we have a little bit more, a little bit more time available for the call, which is a good thing. Uh, just a reminder that the preliminary stage of the annual call is really addressed to producers. So keep in mind that what you're writing in that preliminary template will be uh, assessed by producers. So try to avoid technical language, because if the producers don't understand what you're saying, they will likely rate your, uh, your proposal um, um, less high than the ones they do understand. So this is really just a reminder. The preliminary stage is mainly um, assessed by uh, producer panels from across the country. Um, the producer panels will review their uh, proposals over November and December, and then in uh, January, MLA will be preparing uh, letters to advise uh, proponents of uh, successful or not successful in the preliminary stage, and we will then call for full proposals starting uh, from 29th of January, and that will be open for four weeks. We will um, then have the expert panel meet and assess our pro uh, full proposals in on the 20, 20, 20th and 21st of March next and then the REDME panel will do the final um, assessment of those proposals uh, and they will then advise MLA of the pro uh, projects they would like MLA to invest in for the next financial year. So we've pulled the process a little bit earlier this year, which means that we hope we are able to start up new uh, projects for the 2018-19 financial year by July, come July uh, next year. It might, it might be a little bit... Um, um, of a, yeah, we'll see if we get there, but we will try our best. Um, if you have any questions on the annual call, you're most welcome to ask me, but other than that, I will, um, I will pass the ball to Johan and ask you to briefly introduce yourself, please, Johan, and, um, and then after that to run through the terms reference document, please. Okay. Thank you, Irene. Hello, everyone. Um, those of you who are interested in this parasite, and there are a number on the list of attendees who uh, would be familiar with the fact that MLA has over the last eight years or so invested a fair bit of money in trying to come up with uh, uh, answers to the various questions that surrounds this, uh, this AP complex and parasite. MLA uh, contributed towards uh, refining the PCR diagnostic test that can differentiate the different uh, subtypes from each other, the Aikida, Buffalo, and Kytosi subtypes. MLA invested in the uh, investigating the efficacy. We spent a bit of time uh, 
putting heads together with Albertus de Foss when he was still working at the Tick Fever Center with his South African heritage. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's very keenly interested in Tileria and he did a, a study for us of the av available chemicals on the basis of which we chose bupavaquone as the, as the best candidate at this stage as a therapeutic agent. Um, that has unfortunately not uh, f found favor with cattle council who are very concerned about the long uh, tissue residue. We thought there was a way about it. We actually, uh, uh, cattle council actually contracted a consultant uh, to come up with a way to manage those residues, and we thought uh, came up with a very feasible idea. But nonetheless, cattle council doesn't doesn't like the use of bupavacone. So at this stage, we still don't have a chemotherapeutic agent. MLA also, in addition to the diagnostic test that I mentioned and the efficacy. We did a small-scale efficacy study with Bupavacone just to, to confirm that it would work. And then subsequent to that, we uh, developed a new uh, tissue residue analytical method, and we then did a tissue residue depletion study, which unfortunately turned out to be the death knell for, for that product. Um, we currently have running a project uh, uh, under the auspices of David Emery at the University of Sydney. David also has long history with Tyleria, having worked with Tyleria Pava in East Africa, and he's very familiar with the Muguga cocktail uh, infect and treat a type of vaccination regime that they follow there. So David is currently leading a project, uh, an MLA donor company project, to look at the possibility of coming up with a uh, maybe a similar or whichever way it turns out to be vaccination strategy for Tileria orientalis, but also to evaluate other potential chemotherapeutic agents. So all of that is, has happened on the eastern seaboards. I remember uh, speaking with David Forshaw quite a number of years ago now. I, can't re I don't know if David is currently logged on to this webinar, but uh, yes. we, were in, uh, we were in Albany for a, uh, for a sheep pets conference, and David and I spoke there, and I know that David is interested. And in the meantime, I've seen the report of the prevalence of Tileria work that uh, was done in the Denmark district with uh, David and Dieter Palmer and Danny Roberts and, and uh, Jenny Cotter as, as co-authors. And I'm really impressed, guys, with the quality of that report. It's beautiful work. And, and I guess the, the, the thing that I would like to see happen is that something similar gets done, but on a, on a wider geographic scale so that we know uh, what the situation is in, in WA. So this, this, the, 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 the call for, and the terms of reference for this parasite has come about specifically in response to uh, a call from uh, producers in the Albany district, and, and they talk about the Albany tick, uh, which of course is not, there's no such thing. It's most likely Haemophysalis longicornis, as, as uh, David and, and others found, but we don't know at this stage is how widespread the tick actually is currently. Uh, also, we don't know the infectious status of the tick population in the various geographic areas. We also don't really know the, the full extent of the, the presence of Tileria in cattle in, in, in WA, and so, and or nor, nor do we know the, uh, the subtypes that we're dealing with. Uh, it turned out in the report that David and, and others published that uh, buffalo hardly featured. It seemed to be almost exclusively uh, Aikida and Kytosi, which makes me think that the cattle that brought it in probably came from further south than Queensland, where, where buffalo is, is very prevalent. So, in essence, what I'm saying is that what this terms of reference... Oh, there's feedback. Bad feedback. So what, we, what we're looking for at this stage is uh, a way in which we can provide Western Australian uh, beef producers with ways in which they can better manage the disease, given, as I said earlier, we currently don't yet have a vaccine and we don't have a chemotherapeutic agent, so we, we will both basically be beholden to, to biosecurity measures aimed at, at the management of, of new introductions, and, and it would be really helpful if producers who want to buy cattle into their properties, who, which they might consider to be clean, to know where those cattle come from and what sort of risk from a biosecurity point of view they pose. So I think I've spoken enough. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. 
Thank you very much, Johan. I'll uh, leave it up to people. You can either put up your hand, as I said earlier, or you can just interrupt us and, um, and ask the question. Please. Does anyone have a question for Johan? Remember to unmute if you want to say something. <laughs> Where are we muted? Um, Johan, it's it, David Forshaw here. Um, How are you, mate? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, good. I, I only we only kind of um, found out about about the MLA thing. Um, I think the day before yesterday. So uh, we haven't really put a, a great deal of thought to it, but we're just. Starting to think about it now, but just just to add to your comments about the um, the types of Tyler in WA, all of our cases, every one of them has been uh, all of the clinical cases that we've seen have been Ikeda, and yeah. um, they we have had an, a, a very small number of cases with Ketosi as well. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah it, so it's quite a different. Um, Situation to to the up to the eastern states, it seems. No, 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 no. It's it's actually identical here on the on the eastern seaboard. The clinical cases all have Aikida, and some of them with Kytosi as well. But Aikida is definitely seems to be the the consistently pathogenic one of the three. Yeah. Yes. No. I understand that. But I, what I mean is that the the the, the lack of um, of the other Buffalo. types. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, as I mean, from the from the historical stuff that started being published from about 2009, 2010 onwards, it, yeah, there are a number of papers, and and uh, Bert DeVos was uh, is mentioned in is certainly a co-author of at least one of them, says that yeah, that we've known that buffalo has been in in uh, in Australia for well over 100 years, and it's yeah, it's it was disregarded as it, that's why it was called benign bovine anemia in the past because buffalo wasn't considered to cause any uh, pathogen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Are you anyway, on it, uh, look, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's Steve of Harmer here. Um, I've got a, a further query in terms of how widespread you intend to do this survey because. We have found we had some clinical cases in areas where the bush tick is not supposed to occur at all, and yeah. uh, we, so far we haven't really um, been able to investigate why that is. But yeah. the question is now how 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 if you want to do a survey, how far do you want to go in terms of um, areas in WA? Dieter, I, I, I would urge you to go as, as wide as you can, and, and obviously the wider that you go, that, that'll have budgetary implications, and we might in the end, when we look at your proposal and, and, and we find that our, our, our cloth is not big enough for the coat that you want to cut from it, we might have to then sort of pare back a little bit, but initially mm -hmm. I, would, I would like your proposal to cover all areas where well, let's let's say where clinical cases are known to have occurred, and and it, you may be right. I mean, it might be necessary on those in those areas where longer corners has not yet been found to then go and try and pull ticks off cattle, or do the flagging, or do the dragging, as you did in the Denmark area. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I, my 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 response to that uh, quick response is as as wide as as you think would be necessary. Yes, and also in terms of reference, you, you you want it to be restricted to beef cattle. Why is that? Well, I guess it stems from the fact that MLA gets its levies from beef cattle producers. Oh, okay. Now, yeah. true, it's true that dairy cattle eventually end up in an abattoir, and and they then generate a levy which comes to MLA. But it, yeah, it's a it's still considered to be a, a beef. A, a cattle meat levy, not a not a dairy mm. levy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, while the while the cattle are alive and on pasture and they're producing milk, they they the the the, the problem of Dairy Australia, not of MLA. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit. It's being a little bit pedantic. So you know, I, I, we we wouldn't we wouldn't throw out if there are properties included in the survey which are exclusively dairy properties. I, you know, I think we might swallow a bit hard, but I don't think we'll necessarily disqualify the proposal just on that basis. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to note that Michael has put his actual hand up. I noted. Thank you, Michael, for your patience. Do you have a question? Uh, can you can you hear me if I talk? <clears throat> yes. Yep. I hear you. Oh, great. Technology is uh, usually defeats me. Um, th thanks for taking my question, Johan, and um, nice to hear that David and, and Dieter are on online as well because they can provide some guidance, and uh, we hope to speak to you guys soon. Um, Johan, have you got any sense of how many farms? you would like to be surveyed? I mean, it's, it's similar to the question that Dita asked before, because um, we've been considering the scope of the project and obviously the, the more farms, the, the more expense, but uh, just some guidance around, around that. Yeah. It's a it's a good question, Michael, and because it's it, it's got me completely flummoxed. I think in more ways than one, it's it's almost a biometrical question because it'll it'll be dictated by in a in a specific district, say how how much of the land area do you have to cover to come up with a representative sample? I mean, what we're talking about is a sampling exercise, so it's a matter of taking a uh, drawing a, a representative sample from which a sensible extrapolation can be made. It's of course different with ticks from what it is with internal parasites. For example, ticks can walk quite long distances, you know, so uh, you don't have to in a in a specific district uh, sample all the confluent farms. You can you can sort of uh, skip around a little bit and, and I think still get a pretty good idea of what happens where. I mean, we also know that these ticks use small ground, uh, ground dwelling mammals and birds as, as, as uh, intermediate hosts. And so, you know, they do, they, they not, they mobile, they move around a bit. So I think you can probably get away with, with a, a sampling protocol that gives you a, a representative sample in each district in the areas, as I said earlier to Dita, where, where clinical cases have been known to occur. But not only that, we would certainly also want to know if, if a, a producer has not uh, experienced clinical cases to date, is that because uh, his herd is genuinely free or might they somehow or, or another have managed to, to, uh, to build up a, an, an acquired immunity? Sure. So sorry, I'm, I'm I'm being I'm being vague, but I, I, I the, the short answer is I don't know. But I think it's a statistical one. I think you'll have to employ a, a biometrician or a statistician in your research team to help you work out what would be an appropriate sampling protocol in order to get well, representation. We, I guess we've already uh, considered the the project in those terms and. You yeah, know, we're consulting with our epidemiologists, and we have a sense of what might be um, uh, a sample size that will yield some significant results. Uh, yeah. I, I suppose it yeah. speaks to the, the the bigger question that's maybe on everyone's lips, and and, and that is, what do you want from us? Uh, a, a project proposal that is um, a, as good as we hope it can be, and and the cost can then be discussed later, or can you provide? a bit more guidance about the, um, the the funding available for these projects? The, 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 the answer to the latter part of your question is no. At this stage, I, I, I can't, and I don't really want to because I don't, I, no, I don't want fine. to set... I don't want to set a damper on things. My my usual response to the, the to this type of question is to aim for the stars. If you end up okay. la landing on the eastern seaboard of Australia, that's okay. You know, we, if if you come up with a very ambitious proposal, I you know, we will very quickly say to you, listen, this is more than we've got money for, but I can't tell you yet what that number sure. is. So uh, you'll sure. have to bear with me on that one, I'm afraid. But Thanks, it, you, won't, that's, you, that's won't, you won't get a you won't get a blanket refusal if we if we think your your any any application has merit but it's it's not immediately affordable for us we might get back to you and start negotiating. Hey, listen, uh, if we were to spread this over two or three years instead of trying to do it all in one year or whatever the case might be, I I suspect sure. that this survey, for example, will have to run over at least. 
two summers, you know, to make sure that you get, you know, the, the ticks, multi-host ticks like Haemophysalis uh, won't complete their life cycle easily within a 12-month period. In all likelihood, they will take two years to complete a life cycle. So I think to get proper re representation, you might have to sample over at least two summers. Good advice. Thank you. I can see Stephen now putting his hand up. Thank you. I don't know why technology is failing us today, Stephen. <laughs> Hi there, Johan. Um, Hello, Steve. The, the, the terms of reference seem to be pretty narrowly focused on WA, and I, I suppose my question is if there's work that happens back on the, uh, or is proposed to happen on the eastern seaboard that, in, you know, that, that adds value, informs our understanding of um, transmission um, uh, that may be ap applicable back in WA as well. Is that is it an absolute blanket exclusion if you're not doing this sampling work in WA, or is the door open to um, you know work that adds value um, but might take place on the eastern seaboard? You, uh, Stephen, yeah, I, I guess I guess you would you would have to look at the work that has already been done and the the yep. work that MLA has has uh, funded is not the only work that's happened. A lot of work has been done by the Melburnians, Abdul Jabbar, uh, and his team have have uh, also published quite extensively. So I think you would have to look carefully to find knowledge gaps that 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 are that would be attractive enough uh, confined to the eastern seaboard. The biggest question facing us at the moment or facing Western Australian producers is you know, which are the areas that are most at risk and, and that's why the, uh, the terms of reference is, is framed uh, the way it is. Um, so you know, it's a, it's a, I, I tend to use many words, but I'm, I'm trying to be as, as constructive and encouraging as I can. So if you, if you want to confine the work that you propose to do to the Eastern Seaboard, uh, you'd have to be uh, quite confident that you're going to hit the mark in terms of uh, a, a knowledge deficit that currently exists and, and which, is, which is topical to producers. Uh, but, but the biggest question in, in our current consciousness is the one around the epidemiology in WA. We've, we've got a pretty good handle on what's happening in the Eastern Seaboard, and the, the, the situation has more or less settled, settled down. My understanding is that clinical veterinarians uh, now know where they stand. Uh, some animals, if they're valuable enough, uh, warrant uh, proper care and nursing and, and blood transfusions and so on, but in many cases they just treat the animals with, with kid gloves and, and most of them seem to recover. The morbidity, even though it could be quite high, uh, it, it's not always fatal. Okay, thanks. Uh, Peter Palmer here again. Uh, just one further question in regards to the survey in cattle. It yeah. sort of indicated in the terms of reference that you would consider the PCR to be the way to go as a diagnostic test. Would would you also uh, consider uh, an ELISA as being, um, being much cheaper and much uh, easier to apply, really, in large numbers? Uh, yes, I, I think so, Dieter, and I think in the end it might be a mixture. I know that Cheryl and, and, and I, think, I think Daniel Bogoma uh, helped uh, uh, worked on an ELISA, so I think there is now an ELISA that would be able to distinguish the different subtypes from each other. And in that case, you're quite right. If it's less expensive, then that's obviously the way to go. I think, however, if you want to analyze collected ticks uh, to see uh, whether they contain uh, Tylera, whether yeah. they carry Tylera, and which ones, then I think PCR would need to be the way yeah. to go there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Good um, uh, hi, Cheryl here. I just wanted to make a point about that. Um, so um, with respect to serology, um, it's not a route that I would, having you know, designed the ELISA, I wouldn't necessarily recommend going that route. It actually doesn't discriminate between the types, unfortunately, and the sensitivity is much lower than PCR. So um, it might be useful as a general screen of herds. Um, mm. It's most useful when you've got clinical cases, though. So um, yeah. if it was me designing a project, I would definitely be looking at PCR. Um, I mean, I also have a question with regards to that, just wondering whether um, quantitative PCR would be considered the gold standard method to use here. It's something that we use 
for diagnosis on the East Coast. We've been using it for years now. Um, it's pretty reliable. Um, it's good for distinguishing genotypes, but also looking at um, levels of parasites in, um, in the animal. So I'm just wondering whether that's something that would be of particular interest relative to, say, conventional methods that don't give you that extra dimension in terms of parasite load. Cheryl, thank you. That's really valuable feedback. In answer to your question, my my knee-jerk reaction would be that quantitation uh, in the in the West Australian context is possibly less important. I, I agree with you. Quantitation is of issue when one is de dealing with a clinical case, and you need to know what level of intervention would be required. But if we, for the for the purposes of trying to determine the the geographic spread. Uh, of the parasite, I'm not sure, and especially if, if quantitative PCR is going to cost more than conventional PCR, uh, I think that might be a, a negative. Well, I think you'll find it's actually the other way around, at least in terms okay. of well, in that um, case, I mean, all the of more, the PCRs that we've run. Yep. Yeah, it's the information you can get for your dollar, obviously, it's the, the more attractive. So, yeah, 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 multiplexing just does, in fact, make it cheaper. That sounds good, then. It's an Thank interesting you. parasite. It's, it really fascinates the hell out of me, I can promise you. <laughs> are there any final questions for Johan? We are nearly at a time, but we can do one or, one or two more questions if you like. Guys, you, you have my email address. If, if there's any further questions and you have my, my, my phone, uh, phone number, uh, or if you don't, just pop me an email and, and we can talk at any time if you have further questions after this. Thank, thank you, Johan. Thank you, everyone, thank for your, your patience with us for attending today. Thank you. Thanks, thank Larry. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, then. Thank you. Bye.